Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Director Coach, you are recognized to give testimony on behalf of all four of you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, Chairman Burr, <coughs> Chairman Warner, members of the committee. Um, we are pleased to be here today at your request to talk about an important and perhaps the most important piece of legislation that affects uh, the intelligence uh, community. I'm here with my colleagues. <clears throat> I would like to take uh, <clears throat> the opportunity to explain in some detail uh, Section 702. Given this uh, as a public hearing, uh, and hopefully the public uh, will be watching, uh, our efforts to provide transparency in terms of how we protect the privacy and civil liberties of our American citizens uh, needs to be explained. Uh, the program needs to be understood, and so I appreciate your patience as I <clears throat> talk through in my opening statement uh, the value of 702 to our intelligence community and to keeping Americans safe. Intelligence collection under Section 702 of FISA amendments has produced and continues to produce significant intelligence that is vital to protect the nation against international terrorism, against cyber threats, weapons proliferators, and other threats. At the same time, Section 702 provides strong protections for the privacy and civil liberties of our citizens. Today, the horrific attacks that recently have occurred in Europe are still at the top of my mind. Um, I was just in Europe days before the first uh, attack in Manchester, uh, followed by other attacks that have subsequently taken place. I was in discussion with my British colleagues uh, through, uh, through this, as well as colleagues in other European nations. And my sympathies go out to the victims and families of those uh, that have received these heinous attacks and to the incredible resilience that these communities affected by this violence have shown. Having just returned from Europe less than three weeks ago, I'm reminded of why Section 702 is so important to our mission, of not only protecting American lives, but the lives of our friends and allies around the world. And although the many successes enabled by 702 are highly classified, the purpose of the authority is to give the United States intelligence community the upper hand in trying to avert these types of attacks before they transpire which is why permanent reauthorization of the FISA Amendments Act without further amendment is the intelligence community's top legislative priority. And based on the long history of oversight and transparency of this authority, I would urge the Congress to enact this legislation at the earliest possible date to give our intelligence professionals the consistency they need to maintain our capability. Let me begin today by giving an example of the impact of Section 702 of FISA. It's been cited before, but I think it is worth mentioning again. An NSA FISA Section 02 collection against an email address used by an Al-Qaeda courier in Pakistan revealed communications with an unknown individual located within the United States. The U.S.-based person was urgently seeking advice on how to make explosives. NSA passed this information on to the FBI, which in turn was able to quickly identify the individual as Nazbullah Zazi. And as you know, Zazi and his associates, in fact, had imminent plans to detonate explosives on Manhattan's subway lines. After Zazi and his co-conspirators were arrested, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board stated in its report, and I quote, without the initial tip-off about Zazi and his plans, which came about by monitoring an overseas foreigner under Section, section 702, the subway bombing plot might have, ex have succeeded. This is just one example out of many of the impacts this authority has had on the IC's ability to thwart imminent threats and plots against the United States citizens and our friends and allies overseas. Since it was enacted nearly 10 years ago, FISA has, the FISA Act has 
been subject to rigorous and constant oversight by all three branches of government. Indeed, we regularly report to the Intelligence and Judiciary Committees of both the House and the Senate how we have implemented the statute, the operational value it has afforded, and the extensive measures we take to ensure that the government's use of these authorities complies with the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Further, over the past few years, we have engaged in an unprecedented amount of public transparency on the, on the use of these authorities. <clears throat> in the interest of transparency, and because this is a public hearing, allow me to provide an overview of the framework for Section 702 and the reasons why the Congress amended FISA in 2008. I will then briefly address why 702 needs to be reauthorized and finally, I will discuss oversight and compliance and how we are, are ensuring and continue to ensure the rights of U.S. citizens, rights that need to be protected. <clears throat> At the outset, I want to stress three things as a backdrop to everything else that my colleagues and I are presenting today. First, as I mentioned at the outset, collection under 702 has produced and continues to produce intelligence that is vital to protect the nation against international terrorism and other threats. Secondly, there are important legal limitations found within Section 702 of FISA, and let me no uh, note four of these legal limitations. First, the authorities granted under Section 702 may only be used to target foreign persons located abroad for foreign intelligence purposes. Secondly, they may not be used to target U.S. persons anywhere in the world. Third, they may not be used to target anyone located inside the United States, regardless of their nationality. And fourth, they may not be used to target a foreign person when the intent is to acquire the communications of a U.S. person with whom a foreign person is communicating. This is generally referred to as the prohibition against reverse targeting. The third item I would like to stress is that we are committed to ensuring that the intelligence community's use of 702 is consistent with the law and the protection of the privacy and civil liberties of Americans. And to that end, in the nearly 10 years since Congress enacted the FAA, there have been no instances of intentional violations of Section 702. I'd like to repeat that. In the nearly 10 years since Congress enacted the amendments to the Freedom Act, uh, the act that established uh, FISA, there have been no instances of intentional violations of Section 702. With those points as a backdrop, now let me turn to a discussion of why it became necessary for Congress to enact Section 702. I do this so that the American public can hopefully better understand the basis for this important law. The Foreign Intelligence and Surveillance Act was first passed in 1978, creating a way for the federal government to obtain court orders for electronic surveillance of suspected spies, terrorists, and foreign diplomats located inside the United States. <clears throat> When originally enacting FISA, Congress decided that collection against targets located abroad would generally be outside of their regime, FISA's regime. That decision reflected the fact that people in the United States are protected by the Fourth Amendment, while foreigners located abroad are not. Congress accomplished this in large part by defining electronic surveillance based on the technology of the time. In the, 19, in the 1970s, overseas communication were pre predominantly carried by satellite. FISA, as passed in 1978, did not require a court order for the collection of these overseas satellite communications. So, for example, if in 1980, NASA intercepted a satellite communication of a foreign terrorist abroad, no court order was required. However, <clears throat> by 2008, Technology had changed considerably. First, U.S.-based email services were being used by people all over the world. Second, the overseas communications that in 1978 were typically carried by satellite 
were now being carried by fiber optic cables, often running through the United States. So to continue the same example, if in 2008 a foreign terrorist was communicating by using a U.S.-based email service, a traditional FISA court order was required to compel a U.S.-based company to help with that collection. Under traditional FISA, a court order can only be obtained on an individual basis by demonstrating to a federal judge that there is probable cause to believe that the target of the proposed surveillance is a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. This had become an ever more difficult and extremely resource intensive process. And therefore, due to these changes in technology, the same resource intensive legal process was being used to conduct surveillance on terrorists located abroad who were not protected by the Fourth Amendment as was being used to conduct surveillance on U.S. persons inside the United States who are protected by the Fourth Amendment. By enacting 702 in 2008 and renewing it in 2012, both times with significant bipartisan support, Congress corrected this anomaly, restoring the balance of protections established by the original FISA statute. And although I will not go into great detail here regarding the legal framework for FISA Section 702, I will simply note a few key items. First, the statute requires annual certifications by the Attorney General and by the Director of National Intelligence regarding the categories of foreign intelligence that the intelligence community will acquire under this authority. Second, the statute requires targeting procedures that set forth the rules by which the intelligence community ensures that only foreign persons abroad are targeted for collection. Thirdly, the statute requires minimization procedures protecting U.S. persons' information that may be incidentally acquired while targeting foreign persons. And finally, each year, the FISA court reviews this entire package of material to make sure the government's program is consistent with both the statute and with the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. We have publicly released lightly redacted versions of all these documents, including the most recent Fisk opinion, to ensure the public has a good understanding of how we use this authority. The government's Section 702 program, as we have said, is subject to rigorous and frequent oversight by all three branches of government. The first line of oversight and compliance is within the agencies themselves, whose offices of general counsel, privacy and civil liberties offices, and inspectors general all have a role in FISA 702 program oversight. The majority of the incidents of noncompliance that are reported to my office and to the Department of Justice are self-reported by the participating agencies. In addition, the Office of the DNI and Department of Justice conduct regular audits, focusing on compliance with the targeting procedures as well as on curing, uh, querying of collected data and on dissemination of information under the minimization procedures. Also, we have regular engagements with an extensive reporting to Congress about the FISA 702 program. For example, the Judiciary and Intelligence Committees receive relevant orders of the FISA Court and associated pleadings, descriptions and analysis of every compliance incident, and certain statistical information, such as the number of intelligence reports in which a known U.S. person was identified. And finally, of course, the FISA Court regularly checks our work, both through the annual recertification process and through regular interactions on particular incidents of noncompliance. Members of the FISA Court, who are all appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, represent the best of the best of our judicial community. They have vast judicial experience and are committed to the constitutional responsibilities of protecting the privacy of U.S. persons. We are particularly proud of our oversight and compliance track record. The audits of the program conducted by the ODNI and DOJ have shown that unintended error rates are extremely low, substantially 
substantially less than 1%. Further, and I want to emphasize this, we have never, not once, found an intentional violation of this program. There have been unintended mistakes, but I would note that any system with zero compliance incidents is a broken compliance system because human beings make mistakes. The difference here is that these, none of these mistakes has been intentional. When do we, and when we do find unintentional errors and compliance incidents, we ensure that they are reported and corrected. This is an extraordinary record of success for the diligent men and women of the intelligence community who are committed to ensuring that our, their neighbor's privacy is protected in the course of their national security work. And with that, I'd like to turn to the most recent compliant incident, which resulted in a significant change in how the National Security Agency conducts as a, a portion of its FISA 702 collection. A recent example of the oversight process at work, uh, as a recent example, NASA identified a compliance incident involving queries of U.S. persons' identifiers into Section 702 acquired upstream data. Upstream data refers to when NASA receives communications directly from the Internet with the assistance of companies that maintain these backbone networks. The FISC FISA court was promptly notified, and DOJ and ODNI worked with NSA to understand the scope and causes of the problem, as well as to identify potential solutions to prevent the problem from reoccurring. The details of the incident are publicly available, and Admiral Rogers will go or can go into more detail during the question and answer session if you would like. But just allow me briefly to state what happened. NASA identified and researched a compliance issue. NASA, excuse me, NSA uh, reported that issue to DOJ, ODNI, and ultimately the FISA court. The court delayed its consideration of the 2016 certifications on that basis until the government was able to correct the issue. NSA determined that a possible solution to the compliance problem was to stop conducting one specific type of upstream collection. So ultimately, we decided that the most effective way to address the court's concerns was to stop collecting on this basis. It's called the abouts portion of upstream collection. And by abouts collection, I'm referring to NSA's ability to collect communications where the foreign intelligence target is neither the sender nor the recipient of the communication that's made, but is referenced within the communication itself. The FISA court agreed with our solution and approved the program as a whole on the basis of the NSA proposal. In short, what I'm trying to say here is, is that a compliance issue was identified, and after a great deal of hard work, the Department of Justice and the intelligence community proposed to the FISA court an effective solution that took the relevant collection costs and compliance benefits into account, and the court agreed with the proposed solution. That is how the process works, and it works well. Before I conclude, I would like to speak briefly about an issue that has been the subject of much public discussion. There have been requests, numerous requests, from both Congress and the advocacy community for NSA to attempt to count the number of United States persons whose communications have been incidentally acquired in the course of FISA 702 collection. During my confirmation hearing and in a subsequent hearing before this committee, I committed to sitting down with Admiral Rogers and the subject matter experts in the intelligence community to understand why this has been so difficult. Within my first few weeks on the job, I visited NSA, discussed with Admiral Rogers and his technical people, uh, and followed through on my commitment. What I learned was that the NSA has made Herculean, this is hard for me to say, they have made extensive efforts. <laughs> Herculean, I think, is the, uh, is the, say that again. Herculean. Herculean, Herculean. All right, I have to turn to, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean really tough efforts, all right? <laughs> to devise a counting strategy that would be accurate and that would respond to the question that was asked. 
But I also learned that it remains infeasible to generate an exact, accurate, meaningful, and responsive methodology that can count how often a U.S. person's communications may be incidentally collected under 702. I want to be clear here. To determine if communicants are U.S. persons, NSA would be required to conduct significant additional research trying to determine whether individuals who may be of no foreign intelligence interest are U.S. persons. And from my perspective as the Director of National Intelligence, this raises two significant concerns. First, I would be asking trained NSA analysts to conduct intense identity verification research on potential U.S. persons who are not targets of an investigation. From a privacy and civil liberties perspective, I find this unpalatable. Second, those scores of analysis that would have to be shifted from key focus areas, such as counterterrorism, counterintelligence, counterproliferation, issues with nations in which, such as North Korea, we need, and Iran, we need continuous and critical uh, intelligence missions. I can't justify such a diversion of critical resources and the mass of critical resources that we would need to try to attempt to reach this e even without the ability to reach a definite number. I can't justify that at a time when we face such a diversity of serious threats. And finally, even if we decided the privacy intrusions were justified, and if I had unlimited staff to tackle this problem, we still do not believe it is possible to come up with an accurate, measurable result. I'm aware that the Senate Intelligence Committee staff will be meeting following this public hearing in a classified session, and Admiral Rogers has instructed his experts to address this issue in greater detail. Before I wrap up my remarks, I want to provide one final example that I have, for the purposes of today's hearing, chosen to declassify using my authority as the Director of National Intelligence to further illustrate the value of Section 702. Before rising through the ranks to become at one point the second in command of the self-proclaimed Islamic State of Iraq in Al-Sham, ISIS, Haji Iman was a high school teacher and imam. His transformation from citizen to terrorist caused the U.S. government to offer a $7 million reward for information leading to him. It also made him a top focus of the NSA's counterterrorism efforts. NSA, along with its IC partners, spent over two years, from 2014 to 2016, looking for Haji Iman. This search was ultimately successful, primarily because of FISA Section 702. Indeed, based almost exclusively on intelligence activities under Section 702, NSA collected a significant body of foreign intelligence about the activities of Haji Iman and his associates. Beginning with non-Section 702 collection, NSA learned of an individual closely associated with Haji Iman. NSA used collection permitted and authorized under Section 702 to collect intelligence on the close associates of Haji Yaman, which allowed NSA to develop a robust body of knowledge concerning the personal network of, his, of Haji Yaman and his close associates. Over a two-year period, using FISA Section 702 collection and in close collaboration with our IC partners, NSA produced more intelligence on Haji Yaman's associates, including their location. NSA and its tactical partners then combined this information, the Section 702 collection, which was continuing, and other intelligence assets to identify the reclusive Haji Iman and track his movements. Ultimately, this collaboration enabled U.S. forces to attempt an apprehension of Haji Iman and two of his associates. On March 24, 2016, during the attempted apprehension operation, shots were fired at the U.S. Forces aircraft 
from Haji Iman's location. U.S. forces returned fire, killing Haji Iman and the other associates at that location. Subsequent, subsequent Section 702 collection confirmed Haji Iman's death. As you can see from this sensitive example, Section 702 is an extremely valuable intelligence collection tool and one that is subject to a rigorous, effective oversight program. And therefore, allow me to reiterate my call on behalf of the intelligence community without hesitation, my call for permanent reauthorization of the FISA Amendments Act without further amendment. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your patience, and we would be willing to be open to your questions. Thank you, Director Coates. Uh, 